Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, good to have you all here. Uh, we're just uh, having people coming in at the moment, so we'll just give them uh, a minute or so to get in, and uh, and then we'll kick off. Uh, thank you for your patience. Okay, I'm just going to start off with a few introductions um, before we kick off on the presentation. Um, so my name is uh, Rafiq Jafar. I am a partner at Altamini uh, in the banking and finance team. And uh, I cover uh, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain. Um, my colleagues today uh, are include uh, Agati Trikiri, who is a senior associate in our banking team based in Riyadh and uh, Mohammed Nigam, who is a litigation lawyer, a senior associate uh, in our disputes team based in Riyadh. And uh, Mohammed specifically looks at uh, quite a bit of banking related uh, litigation, security enforcement, and uh, specifically uh, bankruptcy related work um, uh, that's been happening uh, in <clears throat> substantially in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, so we're happy to have you here today. Uh, our presentation on uh, Saudi Arabia's new movable asset security law and the significant amendments that happened on the commercial pledge law. Uh, the way we will uh, structure this presentation is uh, I will start off uh, with more on the security creation side and, and what are the changes uh, to, to what, that have come about. Um, uh, the changes that have come about. And then after that, uh, we will uh, uh, go into the enforcement aspects uh, of the law. Um, there is a uh, discussion box, there is a chat box in the, in your, uh, on your screen. So please feel free to include, um, your, uh, include your questions. Uh, we'll be taking your questions, uh, we'll be looking at your questions. My colleague Agati will be looking at your questions as we go forward. Uh, and then during the presentation, uh, she will uh, she will read out those uh, questions, the, the, uh, the ones that are significant. And then towards the end of the presentation, uh, we can also look at some questions and uh, and respond to them. Either you could ask the questions yourself, or we could pick them up from the chat box. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, um, just to give you uh, a bit of um, the agenda in terms of what we'll be covering today. So. We'll, we'll be covering the, uh, obviously the movable asset security law and how it interplays with the uh, commercial pledge law. Uh, then we'll be ta talking about the types, the new types of security that can be created uh, under the new legislation, uh, the types of assets that are covered, uh, the classes of assets uh, that are covered. Then we will go into uh, the process and the contractual requirements for creating uh, security under the new law and the perfection requirements. Uh, we'll talk about priority and tracing, um, the introduction of the new registration system, uh, and then go into some of the enforcement uh, and bankruptcy considerations, which my colleague will take you through. Um, the next slide. So we had, uh, back in 2018, we had the commercial pledge law that came out. And this was a significant departure from uh, the previous system. It was quite unclear in terms of how you created security. Uh, so the new law that came out in 2018, the commercial pledge law, it, it kind of uh, specified uh, that you could create security over present assets, over future assets. Uh, over bank accounts, fluctuating balances, and even floating floating charges. Um, so all of these things came in. The registration system came in as well. 
Um, however, there were some issues with, uh, uh, with, with the law, but more specifically with the registration system, which was quite cumbersome and difficult to operate. Then this year in 2020, in April of uh, 2020, we had the introduction of the new movable asset security law. And at the same time, the commercial pledge law was also um, amended. They also simultaneously brought in a new registration system, uh, which is very efficient, very user friendly, and, and the, uh, the staff that operates it is also very responsive with any questions um, uh, that come about. Now, our view, our house view of, the, of how the two laws work together is that the movable asset security law should be looked at as a overarching legislation. It's an overarching legislation and all other uh, types of security on movables actually should feed into that law. So for example, the commercial pledge law um, is a type of pledge which is covered under the umbrella of the movable asset security law. So the approach that, um, uh, that we and, and market, other market participants have taken is that you have the, uh, you, you need to comply with both the requirements of the movable asset security law, as well as the amendments, uh, as well as the commercial pledge law in order to create uh, a, a commercial um, pledge. So uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, what the movable asset security law has done has, has sort of created a, um, a, a wide variety of security that, act, that can actually be created, uh, you, you know, part of financing transactions in Saudi Arabia. Um, earlier, it was quite restrictive and it was specifically, you would look at, you would look at a pledge and nothing else. Uh, but now the, uh, uh, the scope of creating security is, is much wider. And if I take you through some of the uh, types of security. So the first one is, of course, a commercial pledge, um, which is governed under the commercial pledge law. Uh, this is a straightforward pledge. You're creating security over a, a, a movable asset. Um, the second one is a repurchase arrangement. Uh, now, this should be distinguished from a, a, a repo on uh, securities. That would not be part of this particular, uh, uh, particular type of security. Here, you are talking about types of movable assets, uh, for example, you know, uh, commodities or, uh, or even machinery, and you're just using the repurchase transaction as a, as a method uh, of uh, creating security. Um, transfer of ownership of movables as security, that's pretty straightforward. Um, the next one is an install, sort of an installment sale retention of title type security, where you sell an asset uh, you collect the price of the asset over a period of time. And during that period, the, the seller actually retains the title to that asset. And so it's, it's an installment sale uh, uh, type arrangement, um, which, is, which is quite common actually in Saudi Arabia. Now here, here there are some regulatory issues that will also arise. Um, I mean, the question is what type of entity can actually provide this uh, installment sale structure and um, because there is a because there are laws that restrict it only to finance companies and companies that have a, a you know an installment sale type license, so so that's a, that's a regulatory point there, and then we have assignment of rights, by way of security. So here we're talking about direct agreements, uh, assignments under other types of contracts uh, as security, and finally you have uh, a, a transfer of rights. Uh, in receivables, but again, as security. So we're not talking about a factoring arrangement or a forfeiting arrangement. We're talking strictly about um, uh, assignment or transfer of receivables by way of security. Um, so these are the types of security. And moving on to the next slide, we look at what assets are actually covered under uh, this type of, uh, under, the, uh, under, the movable, under the new movables law. And it covers, obviously here we're talking about movables. We're not talking about immovables. We're not talking about land. We're not talking about building, et cetera. We're talking about only movable assets. Um, and what the law says is that it covers both tangible as well as intangible assets. It covers both current as well as future assets and current and future rights. So when we're talking about tangible assets, we're obviously talking about goods, machinery, the usual types of assets. 
intangibles, you may be talking about certain types of intellectual property, not all, but certain types of intellectual property, perhaps goodwill uh, could be covered under that. Um, and when you're talking about future, uh, uh, future uh, assets, you're talking about something that would come into existence uh, in the future. Um, it could be by way of a floating charge. It could be uh, by way of some machinery that is in, that's, you know, uh, currently being uh, procured and uh, becomes part of the security. And similarly with rights, uh, you, could, you could cover rights under an agreement. Uh, those rights will be created in the future or also something as vague as book debts. Now looking at this, uh, looking at the assets, uh, asset classes a little more closely. So we've talked about rights and receivables. That's the first one. The second one is credit balances with banks and financial institutions. So this is a very crucial one. As we know earlier, you could only create security over a fixed deposit, and now you can create security over a current account. So which means an operating account where the balances are fluctuating. And I think that's a big advantage uh, in, in, in that's come out through the previous law, but also this particular law. And um, <clears throat> the third point is quite, is quite new. Uh, here we're talking about commercial papers, such as promissory notes, uh, bank certificates of deposits and bills of lading. Um, so this is a new asset class that previously, uh, you know, you would not create security. You would do an outright transfer, but you would not create security over. So this law now introduces this new type of security. Uh, vehicles. Uh, now vehicles, again, uh, there was no formal system of uh, creating security or a pledge over vehicles uh, previously. And it was always a retention of title type of structure that was used in uh, either fleet financing or uh, even individual uh, car finance. And, and I think this, what, 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 what the system does is the system allows you to create the security. And I think the system is also in our discussions with the, uh, with the operator is basically, they are also linking themselves to the traffic authorities so it could ultimately prevent the transfer of the vehicle based on, uh, um, based on this registration. And then you have the usual equipment stock talks about agricultural, uh, uh, agricultural products and then uh, immovable by attachment. So you have a, if you have a movable object which is attached to an immovable object that may also be covered under this law. If you move on to the next uh, next slide. Um, so here we talk about excluded assets. Uh, what, what type of assets are not part of this law? And essentially the rule is that if there is another registry, if there's a specific registry that covers those types of assets, then they would not be covered. So for example, ships and aircraft, uh, very obvious. Uh, they have their own register and so it is not covered under this law. Securities listed on the capital markets. So your know, securities listed on the Tadawal, would not be, they would have their own security creation process, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which is prescribed by the CMA. Uh, the third one is a, little, um, is a little bit confusing where we talk about goods deposited in public warehouses, um, unless the security interest has been created prior to them being deposited. So now, you know, here you would, you, perhaps you could do uh, security by way of possession where the warehouse keeper acts as the bailey. Um, so it's, it's not really entirely clear how, how you would create this type of security, which is warehoused, uh, but maybe one of the ways is by taking possession of the goods. Trademarks again, because it has its own register. Investment accounts, I think this is a significant one. Uh, with investment accounts, obviously the, uh, we are talking about accounts which are regulated by the Capital Markets Authority. And uh, these are accounts which are sort of omnibus accounts that CMA authorized persons uh, hold uh, with their bank uh, on and sort of a client account for, for, for their clients. So you can't create security over that, but you could possibly take an assignment of rights uh, under the investment account uh, agreement. So, that, so you would not create a security over the account itself, but the rights emanating from the agreement under which the investment account is, is, is held. Um, yeah, moving on to the next slide. Now, now we talk about two things. Uh, one is how is the 
uh, what are the contractual requirements for creating the uh, security under the new law? And the second is what are the perfection requirements uh, under, the, under the new law? So, so both of these things have to be satisfied to create a valid security interest. Uh, the first point, uh, obviously, you know, you would assume that the uh, uh, security contract would be in writing, but I think the second part of that, which is that it can be within another contract. So you could have a facility letter or a standard terms and conditions, which also contains the uh, security related provisions. Um, uh, in, in that. So, you know, something uh, which earlier it was always the security document was was different. The, uh, uh, you know, the facility agreement was different. Now here you have the opportunity of, of combining the two, making it more, uh, I guess, user friendly uh, for, for the end customer. Um, the second point, again, quite obvious that the security provider should have legal rights to create the security. So it should either be the owner or the, the, the lessee have some leasehold interest, et cetera, in the property. Um, then looking at the definition of secured obligations. Now, this is quite, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, is, is quite specific. So you can, the secured obligations can be defined in a, quite generally or specifically. So when you're talking about it being defined specifically, it's the secured obligations are obligations arising out of a, for example, facility agreement. Uh, whereas if you're talking about more generally, you could say something like, the you know, all obligations of uh, the customer from time to time taken from this bank are covered under this security. Um, however, what's crucial is you do need to have a um, maximum limit that is prescribed. So you can have it more generic, but you do have to have this maximum limit. Um, so you, you could say, so you could have basically an all money security, which, which works up to say 100 million SAR. Um, so something like that. Uh, the next point, again, I think it, this is this is again quite quite interesting because it sort of creates the ability to create a, a floating charge. So security to be gen the security. So here we're talking about the asset to be generally or specifically described, uh, so as to allow identification entire assets of the security provider. So you can actually have the entire assets of the security provider, uh, sort of a floating charge type arrangement, um, or you could have a general or specific class of assets. So again, you could take you know, raw materials, for example, or book debts, for example, or uh, you know, receivables uh, arising from uh, these sources, for example. So you can play around with it quite a bit and it offers a lot of flexibility and something quite close to a, 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 an English law floating charge. Now, one interesting point here and, and why we're quite confident that this works as a floating charge is that in the registration system, there is actually an option for a floating charge. So where, the, where it says type of security to be created, one of the types of security is um, a floating charge. And that's why uh, you know, this would be the interpretation of this particular point. Uh, moving on to the next slide, we come on to perfection. So in terms of perfection, there are two, two ways in which you could perfect. One is by way of registration uh, on the unified registry of, uh, uh, of rights on movable assets. So the new registry that's been set up. And the second is by way of possession. So the first point is pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, anyone can register, uh, even a foreign entity can, can, can register uh, on this system uh, and, and become a security, uh, sec beneficiary of security on the system. Um, the second one in terms of possession um, it could either be possession, actual possession, or it could also be constructive possession or deemed possession. So you could have uh, you, you could have a point of bailey, and the bailey would hold the assets uh, on behalf of um, um, you know the uh, the secured party. Uh, this could be the bailey could be a collateral manager. Uh, it could be another bank. It could be uh, it could be an, an official of the company itself. Um, who could act as the bailey and, and take that control and hold it at, on behalf of um, the secured party, the financing party. Now, registration versus possession has an impact on priority, but not in all cases. So one of the places where it does not have uh, an impact is when you talk about bank accounts and instruments uh, which are transferable by endorsements such as promissory notes. So taking a bank account, a bank account 
can be, uh, uh, you don't register, you don't register the, uh, the security interest. You, it, it is only perfected by way of possession. So possession is the only method of, uh, of perfection. And you find that a lot of banks actually follow that and they don't actually, they don't actually register. Um, a few banks have taken, the, uh, have taken the view that because it is so easy to register under the new system and the costs are fairly minimal, it might be better to, by way of abundant caution, to actually do the registration. But under the law and the implementing regulations, you do not need to uh, uh, register. You only have to have possession. Now you have possession in a sense, you have possession. So let's say the account bank is different from the secured party. Uh, so then the account bank would have to make certain uh, representations that it is holding these, uh, uh, holding this account on behalf of the uh, secured, uh, secured party. Uh, coming to assignment of receivables and rights. Uh, now here, there is a requirement for notice only. So you do need to provide notice. So you don't need a consent or an acknowledgement from the underlying debtor. So to the underlying debtor, you just need to serve notice that the assignment has occurred and these receivables have been assigned by way of security to XYZ Bank. Uh, but you don't need to wait for, an, uh, for a consent. And the second point is that if there is a restriction in the, uh, in the contract that prevents uh, uh, assignment without consent, that restriction would not invalidate the security interest that's being created. So this is quite a departure from the previous, uh, uh, previous uh, where you actually needed consent for security. But now it's very clear that under this particular law, uh, you don't need to buy and you don't need to. Uh, um, and if there's a restriction, that restriction would not, would not be applicable. One more point here is that you could create under the commercial pledge law that you could still create a pledge over the receivables or rights and uh, uh, the movable asset security law talks about an assignment and it's only in the case of an assignment that you need to serve notice. In the case of a pledge, it's not clear. Uh, so one of the approaches that banks are taking is to do both. Uh, and, and actually serve the notice as well. All right, moving on to the next slide. And just a quick word on registration. Um, so the new registration system called the Unified Register for Rights Over Movable Assets uh, has been established. It's working, as I said, uh, very smoothly. Uh, it, it's a very easy system to use. It's not restricted to uh, Saudi banks. Uh, and Saudi entities, you can be established outside Saudi Arabia and still uh, create security and register security. There's a six month transition period where if you have registered on the earlier, uh, on the earlier unified register, you need to transfer that security onto the, uh, onto the new registry and then that, that priority would, would carry through. So that, that ends in October. And uh, I think that's, that's pretty significant work that needs to be done. Um, yeah, and then I think the filing of the electronic form, uh, the search functions, et cetera, on the, uh, on the security register are very, very easy to use, uh, very user friendly. And uh, I think it just requires, you know, to get onto the system and have a quick browse around to understand what's going on. Uh, I can go to the next slide, please. Now, talking a little bit about priority and tracing. Um, so in terms of priority, what the law says is that if you have created uh, security under the movable asset security law, and there is some other type of security which has not been created under the law, uh, although it has to cover an asset that would be uh, subject to the law, um, it would be the security that's created under the movable asset security law that would take priority. If there is an, a registered security and any other type of security, uh, the registered security would have priority. If there are multiple registered security interests, then the one, the registered security that's first in time and date would, would take priority. And if there are multiple unregistered security interests, then again, the one that has priority in uh, time and date would, uh, would basically take priority. Uh, once you've created security on the system, you have priority over labor rights as well as government uh, entitlements. Uh, so this was a good uh, sort of new addition to the law. 
In the next slide, let's talk just briefly about tracing. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so the next slide. So if, um, if you have an enforceable uh, interest against third parties, so if you have created security correctly under the law and that that particular asset is sold for a period of 15 days, you can actually trace into those proceeds and you're entitled to take the proceeds of that, of that sale. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, one would, ex I think that's quite a, a difficult rule to follow because it's, it's only a 15 day period. Um, perhaps that could have been longer or the, or the actual uh, date would not be specified. The limitation period would not be specified, uh, but it is and so the 15 day period. So, so I, I would say that security takers, uh, secured parties need to be quite uh, vigilant on when the, when the asset is liquidated uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the security provider. Uh, just a quick word, next slide please. A uh, quick word on, uh, on the commercial, on the difference, what has happened in terms of the amendments to the commercial pledge law. Uh, so one is that the concept of floating charge was removed, but as we saw, it has been now moved on to the movable asset security law. So in, in substance, that, that option is still there. I think the second bullet point is very significant. Uh, the scope of the commercial pledge law has been expanded by deleting the term economic debt. Because the term economic debt, the inclusion of that term meant that it was only uh, a commercial transaction that was covered by the law. Uh, and retail transactions. So, for example, if you have, if you're, if the bank is providing a retail facility for financing washing machines and vehicles and etc., where would you register that type of security? So now, by removing this, you can even retail loans and retail financing falls under the ambit of uh, of this law. Uh, we've talked about registration. Uh, we've talked about uh, ancillary components. So I, I think we can move on to the next uh, next slide. And I think the next slide, uh, just a couple of points here as well. Uh, enforcement, the earlier enforcement process is not, uh, uh, the, the provisions relating to the enforcement process have been deleted. And uh, now that's covered under the commercial, uh, under the movable asset security law. And my colleague, uh, Mohammed Nigam will, will speak to those provisions. Um, so while the commercial pledge law retains the concept of a economic register, uh, there is no requirement to now, uh, uh, sorry, economic uh, pledge, uh, a, a sort of a mortgage of a commercial business, that there's no more requirement to actually register that at the Ministry of Commerce. Uh, so this is again, a slight, slightly unclear in terms of what would happen there. And then the last bullet point, which relates to limited liability uh, shares of an unlisted company, of a limited liability company and a um, joint stock, closed joint stock company. Um, so with that, uh, Agathi, are there any questions we should take now before we go into the enforcement? Um, there are some questions that are focused on registration. I don't know if you wanna take this now. Um, one of the questions that, that, that we have that has been repeated is whether uh, when filing the security on the registry, one application can be made to register multiple securities or for each security, a separate application needs to be filed. My understanding is that there has to be a separate application for each security that uh, has to be uh, registered. Um, but I think, do you understand anything different? No, I think that's correct. You, for each security, uh, for each time you're creating a security interest over the same security, it would be a, a different filing that would be done. Another question that has to do with registration, um, it's uh, what should be the registration expiry date? Um, here it says that although there is a tenor under each facility, however, final maturity days are usually defined as the date when all obligations have been settled by the borrower. Thus, the final maturity date could go beyond the tenor of the facility and may not be envisaged at day one. Question is, what should be the ideal way to record pledge expiry date? Uh, in case final maturity date goes beyond the pledge registration expiry date, will the security agent still be able to get benefit in case of enforcement scenario? I believe that the expiry date is 
that you, you would put down is the estimation of when would be um, uh, the, the final maturity date, the date on which you would expect the obligations to be settled. If this is extended, um, I think that the, the, the registration would have to be amended accordingly. Uh, that, that is my understanding. I think that's correct. I think, do you agree? Yeah. yeah, I think that what we've been seeing is in practice, we've been seeing a buffer being put in, put in. So if it is, uh, if it is, you know, 10 years, uh, they, they probably have 11 or 12 years as the final maturity date to keep that, uh, 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 to keep that buffer in place. Uh, there's also another question on secured obligations and whether they are required to be specified. How do we state the maximum amount for open money facilities? I think yeah. I think your point is covered in this uh, um, a big point, Rafik. Basically, the, the, the law says that it, ha it can be generally or specifically described, and that includes including a maximum amount. Um, the generally described can mean that you do not need to say a specific amount. However, from what we see in the market and from what we understand that the courts prefer to see, it's always preferable that you include the maximum amount that is being secured. So again, as you would include, uh, let's say, um, you would estimate what your profit element is and you may include a buffer just to be on the safe side that this is the maximum amount and, 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 and uh, register it accordingly. Um, I think, Agathi, okay, let's, uh, let's, move some, to, yeah. let's move on to enforcement and then we'll take the remaining questions uh, at the end. Okay. Um, uh, Mohammed, do you okay. want to go ahead? Uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you, Rafiq. Hello, everyone. Um, we will start to next slide, please. Um, uh, talking about the informants. Uh, enforcement according to uh, memorable uh, asset security law, the new law that was uh, three months ago, three, 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 uh, over more than uh, three months ago. Um, here we will talk about actually this, this law came with new ideas as uh, as Rafiq mentioned. Uh, one of these new ideas, uh, self-help parameters. Yes, self-help parameters started uh, with commercial pledge law two years ago, but this law actually took a different approach from the commercial pledge law. Uh, in commercial pledge law, it was prohibited uh, for parties to agree that uh, the creditor can own the, the, the security to satisfy the, the debt, but this law actually allowed uh, to, to parties actually or the creditors to be owner of the security uh, to satisfy the, the, this state. Uh, there is some uh, uh, condition and requirements to, to make this clause enforceable. Uh, first one should be in writing. And here, according to the, the law and executive population, uh, this uh, writing or the agreement could be during the, the, the agreement itself or could be a separated agreement, whether at, uh, in, 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 in any approach would be impossible. But the main thing or the main condition here is this should be before the default of the debtor. So after uh, the default actually will not be impossible. So these two main things. The, the executive regulation add another thing to enforce this uh, clause or agreement, uh, before taking action by creditors, the creditors should serve actually legal notice uh, to, to, to inform uh, the debtors uh, of the pledge uh, and default, uh, request from uh, it to pay uh, the, the secured obligation. Uh, there is no uh, like period or, or time for that specified by whether the law or executive regulation but we prefer her advice uh, to be 15 days. Uh, and the reason for that actually commercial court law, uh, this new law uh, as well, uh, like uh, issued two months after uh, this law, uh, mentioned like a legal notice is an indictory for all uh, claims that more than one million are. Uh, so this legal notice uh, we prefer to, to give like a period for, for uh, 14 or 15 uh, days uh, for the debtor. Uh, as 
I said, this uh, self help remedy actually gives uh, many options, uh, a wide approach, uh, uh, more than the commercial commercial uh, pledge law. Uh, so the creditor can choose like public auction or buy and sell, or as I said, can can push by the, the security creditor. Uh, and in in the commercial pledge, actually the the, the the were like uh, some procedure to apprise and give uh, like evaluation or, or evaluation for the, the assets. But this law also didn't state it and executive uh, regulation as well didn't state any uh, of that and just said uh, stated it's a quotable price. If we have any disputes regarding this, a quotable price we can go to uh, the competitive court uh, if any. But that's it, it uh, quotable price, uh, not even like a market price, I, I would say, is the they said equitable one or fair one. Um, from practical point of view, this will apply for all uh, uh, kind of securities or kind of agreement that's stated by the law. Practically, uh, from litigation and practical uh, as well, uh, we cannot actually uh, say this will work uh, in, a, in a good way or a smooth way in, in all cases. Uh, the reason of that, if you have a security not in your position as a creditor and um, the, the debtor refuses actually to, to give it to you uh, to, to, to enforce this clause, uh, you cannot do anything but go to the court and take an action for the competent court. Uh, so, from point of view, the, our point of view and practical point of view, uh, if you don't have a position of that security, this uh, clause, even if in writing, will be difficult to enforce. So the, the, we can we can take this in our consideration when we uh, draft this, and and we can put like a legal consequences, uh, right of compensation if or damages that may uh, caused by the debtor uh, in case if refuse or reject our request or credit request to to give uh, security. Um, the good thing also about this law is they give a uh, right to the security creditor to take a necessary action to repair and return or improve uh, security to actually increase the price. This might be help in, in, in a specific agreement or, or some agreements. Um, and also, the, the sometimes you, you can have like a dispute regarding the ownership of uh, of the security. Uh, according to the law, the this uh, execution, uh, non-judicial and also judicial when we come is releasing security from any right uh, created on that security, which give like um, advantage for the new owners to have it to be clear. Uh, and no dispute uh, in the future. Um, if we don't have uh, not sufficient proceeds according to the law, is, uh, I would say the creditor will not have any right to to, to claim the remaining uh, amount. Uh, the, actually, the, the, the law answers this, uh, said the creditor will have the right to, to claim uh, for the remaining amount uh, but this remaining will be unsecured. So the, uh, the secured amount or the security will cover uh, a part of the amount and the other part will will be uh, unsecured, uh, which might give some risks in, in some cases, especially in bankruptcy when we come to it. Uh, next slide. Uh, if we don't have a, a non-judicial clause or we have it, but in, in a practical, we cannot uh, enforce it. Uh, so we will go to the competent court filing uh, a case against uh, the debtor uh, or the one who creates the security or uh, the security provider, I would say, uh, for the, the competent court. Also, the competent court will be uh, uh, title to, to 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 consider cases related to registration disputes. Sometimes we have uh, like disputes related to the details of registration uh, or uh, terminate or or uh, de deregistrate the uh, the security. So if we have such 
think uh, we will go to the competent court to, to resolve this. Uh, related to priorities and this law also stated in in, in, in very explicit uh, way this uh, secure crystal will have first uh, priority before uh, labor rights before government and taxes including tax or government fees which give actually advantage for the secure creditor uh, to get the, like uh, the full the full debt uh, or even the, the most of it. Uh, with uh, minimum uh, risk is uh, 44. Uh, as we said, is uh, the, the, the judicial execution as a non-judicial releasing security for the new owner, so no uh, no risk for the new owner or no dispute for the new owner. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we will actually ask uh, three important questions, uh, especially in the bankruptcy. Uh, the, the bankruptcy is, is a risk for secured uh, creditor or not. We can see the, 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 the main issues that might uh, make us ask a lot of questions related to uh, returium or suspension of the claim periods. Uh, the trustee rights, uh, uh, especially for termination uh, in agreement or replacing the security uh, itself for some cases. Uh, the priorities that we, we mentioned uh, in, in, uh, in movable asset security law and look back periods. Uh, this, the, the main issue we see is that we need to actually see if it considered as a risk for the creditor or not. The moratorium, it uh, uh, depends on the type of bankruptcy because we have three types of bankruptcy. See, procedures. Uh, one is preventive settlement, the other uh, uh, restructuring or financial restructuring, and uh, the last uh, resort or last uh, solution is liquidation. The, each one of them is stated like a moratorium period uh, from 90 days to 36 days in liquidation, no specified uh, period. Uh, the problem with that, you cannot take any action, uh, this including security creditors, uh, against the debtor. But the good thing here is that the law is still bankruptcy law. Uh, give an advantage to the secure uh, creditor to apply to the court to get an approval to enforce uh, security and uh, whether it's non judicial or judicial. So it's, it's a good advantage. Yes, we'll, we'll add like extra uh, procedure, extra time, because you should take like an approval from uh, from the court. But this actually gives an advantage uh, more than the other creditors or unsecured creditors. So we'll not see actually uh, a big risk on that. Uh, the other one uh, the trustee rights, uh, especially in restructuring. Uh, uh, because in restructuring, trustee little bit has uh, some some powers uh, related to termination agreements, related to replacing uh, security with uh, with equivalent uh, security, if that in the favor of the other creditors or or the 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 the, the, the debtor itself. Uh, the good thing, yes, we stated like there are some exception for banks and financing and companies stated that trustee will not able to terminate such agreement. But if we don't have uh, this uh, type of uh, of agreement uh, related to bank or financing, this might be a risk uh, for, for for the the security by non uh, non financial sectors or or banking sectors. The replacing as as well uh, phase uh, phase uh, both of all all of uh, security agreements. Yes, the the, the, the creditor can can uh, file an appeal against trustee uh, can can dispute this. Might be this little bit uh, risk. Uh, there is many arguments in in, in that, uh, but still still we see little risk. But also, as, as we mentioned, and combining with unsecured, it's a better position uh, uh, comparing to that. 
the priority uh, uh, actually still the same, no effect. Uh, one mentioned in, 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 in movable asset security law is the same in, uh, in the bankruptcy. So the security will still have uh, a first uh, and priority over the movable assets. Uh, and if he has an, any uh, uh, any compensation or uh, the, the security not sufficient, uh, also will be uh, able to collect uh, the the insufficient amount or the, the remaining amount uh, as unsecured uh, unsecured or unsecured. Uh, look back periods. Uh, the bankruptcy actually uh, well, uh, stated uh, two look-back periods, uh, 12 months in general, and the 24 months for related parties. Related parties, it's uh, it's uh, between managers, the one who has a business relationship or employment, uh, or uh, the parent companies, or the, the companies that uh, manage with the same parent company, uh, all of them considered as, as a definition of the law as a related party. Uh, the reason of that that might be something uh, tried to to use the damages for other creditors. Uh, that's why it's a little bit uh, longer uh, for uh, like 24 uh, months. But also the this not uh, this not actually affect all agreements. Most of agreements stated in, in the law that will have a look back period or will consider uh, or examined by the court or trustee uh, in during the look back periods, actually you will see this uh, uh, transaction is related to transaction with undervalue of uh, of the assets of the debt source, or I would say like transition uh, transaction with, without consideration. Uh, or something like waiving without uh, uh, or assigning rights with, without consideration. All of that, it's, it's a kind of transaction like unfair. It could cause uh, some damages for for the, the creditors. Uh, assuming that, and, and all of you will not have this approach, we recommend uh, if you have such cases with some some debtor is in in, in bankrupt or declared uh, bankrupt according to the, the court decision uh, not be involved in any agreement without your lawyer without uh, whether in-house or your external lawyer uh, because it's a little bit uh, tricky uh, this uh, arrangement could be another five because if if the, the the court considers this like unfair or something it can harm the other uh, creditors. The the, the 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 panel will be uh, nullifying uh, this uh, this agreement. But also, it has a criminal exposure because uh, in in some cases, uh, the parties could con consider as as committed a crime according to the law, uh, bankruptcy law, and, and get sentenced up to five years uh, or a fine for five million. So uh, not involved in that uh, uh, arrangement, and all of arrangement we could, we we prefer to be in front of the trustee, in front of of the court. Uh, in conclusion, we see uh, comparing with uh, the the legal system we we, we had before. The, uh, this law actually considered as opportunity to give a good position for the security creditors for to actually encourage uh, the, the, the banking sector and financing sector. Uh, that's it, and if you have any question, I will be happy to answer. Agati, do you want to uh, read out the questions? Mm, yes, there are some questions that are uh, for um, Mohammed. One of them is, how will banks outside of KSA enforce security if they are not registered in KSA? If you see, the, like uh, as Rafiq said, we have this uh, registration uh, system. It's uh, uh, online. 
uh, and you can see there is option for the non-Saudi to register their um, uh, their uh, their security. Uh, if you going to 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 enforce this, for sure you ha you have to get an uh, agent, which another uh, another entity uh, or a lawyer uh, can can uh, enforce this. And we 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 actually. Uh, take uh, on behalf of foreign banks and finance companies uh, a lot of uh, a lot of enforcement procedures here. Uh, so it's it's, uh, it's allowed by the law and stated in explicit in, in executive regulation as well. So you can you can take an action, uh, but for sure you will need uh, an agent here. Okay. Uh, one other question was. Uh, can we enforce a perfected security in the event of bankruptcy proceedings against the borrower? Again, because uh, it's cut off uh, voice. Yeah. Uh, one other question was whether we can enforce a perfected security in the event of bankruptcy proceedings against the borrower. So essentially the question is if bankruptcy proceedings are commenced against um, against a borrower, which is the security provider as well, will we be able to enforce that security at that point? Yeah, okay. The uh, the moratorium or suspension actually, uh, according to some cases, could include the security provider, if not the, the debtor, uh, if, if I understand the question uh, right. Uh, so this, uh, Actually, it's stipulated by, by the law. In some cases, you cannot take an, uh, any action against even the security provider. Is that um, I understand uh, it's correct? Uh, I think I think uh, if I can. Yeah. Sorry, Mar uh, Mario Gatti. Uh, yeah. So I was just saying that um, if the borrower is uh, in, uh, in 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 you, you know in a bankruptcy type situation. Um, I guess the, at that point, when you are, you would need to submit your claim to the uh, to the bankruptcy court with respect to the borrower because there might be an unsecured component also. Uh, but in terms of the the security would subsist; it would not be affected. Uh, I mean, you you may need to go through uh, the process of actually enforcing it uh, and seeking the permission of the court to do that. But other other than that, it would not impact the validity of the security just because the borrower has gone into uh, a bankruptcy proceedings. Um, okay. Um, there were other questions. Um, one of them was not related to um, to enforcement specifically. Uh, whether it's possible to have a second degree pledge in Saudi Arabia. It is possible. It is possible to have multiple security interests um, and to have even multiple registered security interests. However, the one that has been registered first has priority. Um, there's another question. In case of a change of the security agent, is there a need to file a pledge registration amendment? there would be such a need. First of all, you need to actually amend the agreement if it's a new security agent. So you would have to also file an amendment to the, uh, to the registration. Um, okay. Um, Rafik, I think this one is for you. Uh, what is the process of moving the rights registered in the old registry to the new registry? And what happens if these rights are not moved by October? Which is the when the six months deadline expires? Right. So I think in the first uh, for the first particular question that you're asking, you would just register it as a, a new security interest on the uh, new register. But then in the there is a there is a um, uh, there is a uh, place where you actually put in certain you know description of the property. And we would recommend that in that space you would make reference to the previous registration and keep the uh, you know keep the confirmation of the previous registration uh, as well. So that's to answer your first question. Um, 
In terms of the second question, uh, you would get priority. So what is the second, second part of the question again, Nagati? Uh, what happens if the um, security is not transferred to the new registry by the October deadline? Yeah, it would be treated as a, uh, um, it would be treated as an uh, unregistered security. So yes. it would, it, you, you, and someone else might get priority. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question which is interesting is about the assignment of receivables. I think we've received this question a couple of times. Um, that we're mentioning that the only perfection requirement when it comes to an assignment is the registration and the notification of the debtor. Um, does that change the market view about requiring the uh, underlying debtor to consent or acknowledge to the assignment? What should the banks be doing? Should they be getting the acknowledgement nonetheless? Um, I think my view is that yes, it does change the market position with respect to security. So if you're creating security, uh, and this is not the only legislation that has this actually, that there is other legislation also uh, which relates to, I think, uh, lease finances which also allows the same sort of structure. So this is not new, uh, but yeah, if you're creating security in this way, then a notification is sufficient, consent is not required. If you were doing something else, if you were doing a transfer, an outright true sale transfer by way of, you know, for, for some sort of factoring product or a true, true sale assignment uh, to, to actually transfer on an outright basis, on a true sale basis, then uh, consent would be required. Okay. Um, I think one, one other question was how does this law correlate, if it does, with the finance lease law? My understanding is that it does when it comes to the types of security interest that it introduces now. Um, the, uh, what was it? Do you have There's a slide a in front of you? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Agadi. I was just saying that there's a specific register for the finance lease uh, law where you can actually. So on that. So, uh, 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 but that does not cover security. That covers more a transfer of the uh, of the rights. So if you're creating, if you're if you're taking the finance lease law, if you're taking trying to take security over the receivables uh, arising under a finance lease, then that would be covered under this particular law. But if it was an outright transfer of the receivables by way of security, by way of a, a true sale, then that would be covered under the finance lease law. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I'm missing any question. If anybody wants to uh, unmute their microphones and ask any questions. Um, Any other questions? All right. Uh, I think, look, I, I, I think this was a good discussion. And Agathe, is there any, any, are there any questions? Um, I think there was a question before um, um, about, uh, from, um, uh, about the maximum amount in the security. The question, if we need to have a maximum amount in the security, then how can we consider that floating charges are included under such security? Well, the floating charge concept that we're using is that um, what, what that allows you to do is to take security over all the assets over all the assets up to a maximum amount. So the, 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 the only difference of the foreign is that, is that you, you, you have the security is that you can take it without specifying which are the specific assets that you're securing. It does not actually, um, the fact that you would mention a maximum amount doesn't in my view impact the, the nature of the security over the assets that you're, that you're charging. I agree with that, yeah. Um, Okay, I, I think uh, I, I think you know uh, our uh, email addresses are up uh, on the screen. Um, you know, please feel free to reach out to any any of us to uh, if you have any follow up questions or uh, clarifications that you require. 
Um, the webinar will also be put up on the on our website. So if you want to revisit the um, uh, you know the, the issues that have been discussed, um, it's been great doing this uh, uh, this webinar with you, and um, and look forward to hearing from you soon. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.